welcome to Life Community Church, our live stream. Um, we like to say that Life Community Church is an imperfect church with imperfect people who endeavor to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. It's a, it's a church where it's okay not to be okay. We just don't want to stay that way, and uh, we just really want to encourage you with that.
bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Let's sing that again. You give light. Jesus, 
the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever of praise. We worship you in this place today. This morning, I want to talk to you about the work of the ministry. Now, this is picking up after last week's lesson. That was Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And during that time, we learned about being a prisoner for the Lord. Now, being a prisoner for the Lord wasn't just Paul being in prison while he wrote this letter. But being a prisoner in the Lord is also being someone who is putting themselves or submitting themselves to this limitation, the 
chains and the bars that limit our life as people in the ministry. We can't do whatever we want, say anything we want. Uh, we can't divide people anytime we want. It, you know, we can't give in to our lower self anytime we want. We have a limitation called being a prisoner for Christ. We have a limit to where we can go. And we also have a limit to where we can physically go and physically what we can physically do. We have limits that other people don't have. And also we have this limit to the chains of, of, of being a prisoner for Christ that focus us in on what our calling is so that we don't waste time doing those things that might seize, seem wise to a man but are not. They're nothing but foolishness according to the wisdom of God. God has a calling for each of us and that's what we're going to be talking about today. We also learned last week that we need to walk in a manner that is worthy of your calling. And this is where uh, the Christian church today really needs to uh, focus their attention. They may be carrying out their calling, but in their life, in their attitudes, and in their emotionalism, or in their anger, they are not walking in a way that is worthy of their calling. Instead of doing what Paul taught us last week to walk humbly, gently, with patience and bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And that is what is lacking in the church today, worldwide, is this, this eagerness, this priority of being in unity. And there is, no, uh, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. And that's what we learned last week. This week we're going to be discussing your individual call in the ministry. And, your in, and the individual call to exercise the gifts that Jesus Christ gave to you as he gave gifts to humanity. But before we begin, I want you to join me in one particular um, pillar of theology that I find in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it is summed up in one word. It's the word journey. I, now, in the past, I've been somebody that tries to stay away from that word journey. It seemed kind of trendy. But really, it is the absolute best word to describe this pillar of theology. This idea of being on a journey. And so, this journey that we go on is is something that talks about progression. It has a starting point, it has an ending point, and it has everything in between. You are on a journey. The church is on a journey. Even Christ himself was on a journey, as we'll learn today. So in this journey, you pass milestones, mile markers. You progress in your journey toward your destination. So no matter whether you're talking about your physical age or spiritual maturity or whether you're talking about uh, the, the time or the, the things that you've learned along the way or the changes that happen in you as far as becoming more like Christ, this can all be summed up with the word journey. So journey is a big part of understanding why the church is organized in the way that it is. Why was the New Testament so full of advice for how to be someone who is part of a local church and to be able to eagerly work toward the, this spirit of unity? And so let's begin with Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. It says, But grace was given to each one, of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts or gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Verse 9 says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints 
for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So let's pray together before we get into this verse by verse uh, discussion about this journey that was just presented to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. It is breathed by the Holy Spirit. It has been recorded for us, and it has been protected by you throughout the centuries so that today we can pick it up and breathe in its truth. We can, Lord, look for uh, the, the presence of God in its words, and we can find you so that when we are personally interacting with your Spirit, we can know it is the Spirit of truth, and we can discern what is the Spirit, other false spirits, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts of the Spirit that you gave to humanity so that we might do the work of the ministry. And we thank you, Lord, for all those who lead the church in all of its capacities, all of the individuals within each local church, which prepare the rest of the saints for the work that they will do in the power of the Spirit. And we pray that, Lord God, as we go through these scriptures, that you would change something in us, that you would change something in our lives, and that you would encourage us, Lord God, that you would renew the calling in each individual's life, and that you, Lord God, would help them gladly say, yes, I am a prisoner for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I will focus in on the limitations of my calling so that I may not waste my life and my purpose. And Lord God, I pray that you anoint us in our homes today. Join and knit us together by that spirit that binds us together in love. Lord God, bind us together now. Even though we are physically distant, bind us together in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So let's get into the word today. Amen. We're going to start with Ephesians chapter 4 verses 7 and 8. We're going to read these together because it's, it's, talking, uh, two, it's talking about two subjects. But I want to talk about one of them in this particular section. So we have Ephesians 7 and 8. It says, but grace. Now grace, you didn't earn it. It's given to you without anything that you've done. Now listen, by, but grace was given. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Listen, there's no limit to what you will encounter on your journey as far as gifts because they're gifts that come according to the gifts that Christ gives, amen? There's no limit to God and His power. And so the gift and the power of that gift, the success of that gift to accomplish its purpose is without limit because it is, gift, it is a gift that comes from Christ. Therefore it says... When he, meaning Jesus, ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men or humankind. Amen. So first of all, let's go over the actual spiritual gifts that Jesus gave humanity. Now, there, is, there are a lot of things that he gave us through grace, salvation. He gave us sanctification. He gave us justification, reconciliation. We've got a lot of shuns uh, in there that he gave us. The list is, and, and when it comes to individual things that he's done for us, it, it's amazing how many gifts he's given to us. But in this particular scripture, it's speaking about the work of the ministry. And so it's the ministry gifts. And so let's begin with an explanation of some of them. And you can find these in the New Testament in Paul's writings, and uh, especially in Corinthians, and I encourage you to read those scriptures. But right now I just want to go through them as topics. The first one is the gift of wisdom. The gift, this gift helps you make choices and gives leadership um, choices, uh, the ability to make choices that are according to God's will. God's will, not personal will, human will, but God's will. The gift of knowledge, the gift of knowledge is to have a comprehensive understanding of a spiritual issue or a circumstance so that you can speak in someone's life and help them through that part of their journey in that circumstance or time. I've seen a lot of words of knowledge coming out through this time of quarantine or this time of shutdown. And many of it, I know, comes right from the Spirit of God. And much of it doesn't, though. 
But the gift of knowledge I've seen in operation in many people's lives. The gift of faith, I've seen that in operation lately. The gift to trust God and to inspire others to trust God no matter what the conditions are. And the gift of healing, the wondrous gift. The, the gift that God uses to heal people he, he, and to cure persons who are ill or wounded or suffering. And this is a gift that is in operation today. Can I have an amen? This is a gift that has never stopped. It is, did not go away with the apostles, but it is a gift that comes from the very heart of God because He loves you. Amen? And then you have the gift of miracles. The, the gift, this gift displays signs and wonders uh, that are miraculous. They give credibility to the word of God and to the gospel message. And the gift of prophecy. The gift to declare a message from God. I believe that preaching should be uh, prophetic. I believe teaching should be pro prophetic. I believe that our conversations uh, should seek the presence of God and, and His prophetic message when people are going through trials or uh, because it is a prophecy before they go through trials. In preparation, they can be uh, someone who receives prophecy. And then you have the gift of discerning spirits. This is something that I believe that the church needs more than ever today. False teachers, false preachers, wolves in sheep's clothing, destroying and dividing churches. That is against what Paul said in the first six verses of this, this chapter 4. But people just ravaging the church because people will believe any spirit. They'll believe any teacher, anything that sounds good to the human mind or to itch ears, but we need the gift of discerning spirits so that we can know whether something is truly from God or in accordance with righteousness. And then we have the gift of tongues. This gift did not go away with the apostles either. This is the gift that to, uh, to communicate in a heavenly language. There's two ways that we do this. One, I believe, is a gift that is available for anybody to pick up who is a Christian, and that is a prayer language. And when you're in prayer with God and you cannot even put into words the depth of the, 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 earn, uh, the earn, uh, earnest um, desire for an answer from God to intervene and you don't even know how to pray for it, the Holy Spirit will pray through you. And then there's also the gift of tongues which requires, it requires interpretation. This is whether you're between two people or a whole congregation. It should be interpreted if it is from the Lord. And this is something that needs to be done by, through the Lord. Tongues has been misused so much uh, out of personal pride or, or out of personal uh, desire to look as though someone is spiritual. And those, those are not always interpreted. And I have heard interpretations for uh, tongues that did not originate from God. And the interpretation, you could tell, had not originated with God. And that's why we need the spirit of discernment. Amen? And so this, this requires an interpretation. And this, in, in, when it is interpreted, it is the same as prophecy. The gift of interpretation, then again, is a gift. Uh, you may never have spoken in tongues uh, for, that uh, is the, in the form of a prophecy, but you may have the, the gift of interpreting tongues. Then we have the gifts of administration, to, to the gift to keep things in order or in agreement with God's principles and to help a, uh, the rest of those who are gifted be able to keep the church unified and moving toward the mission that God has given to that church, both in the Word of God but also by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then we have the gifts of helps. Uh, I see this throughout our church and I'm just so impressed by how people have surrendered to this gift of helps. And this means to go out and do what's needed. What, when you see a need, you meet a need. When you have the, the ability to uh, respond to something, you make the assumption that you have the response ability to meet that, uh, that, that need in someone's life. But there is a problem with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that is that there are among us those who fake the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And this is very destructive to the church. There are people who assume that they have 
the gift of the Holy Spirit in some way. But they're abusing it. They have it for false pretense. Paul, Paul told us <clears throat> about the attractiveness of the gifts of the Holy Spirit when a sorcerer named Simon <coughs> in the book of Acts asked that they lay hands on him so that he could have this gift because he was wanting somebody to have, a, to have notoriety. He wanted to have authority within the church. His desire was not to minister, but to be admired. And so he wanted this gift. And he was rebuked. He was rebuked for wanting this gift for that purpose. And many within the church will fake these gifts. God does not give a gift of the Holy Spirit to someone who is not worthy of it in their walk. Somebody who wants the gift of the Holy Spirit because he sees the needs or she sees the needs of the flock or the community around them and they're spurred on to respond to it. So spiritual maturity is not the same as worldly maturity. And I see this problem in the churches many times. Our church has been ravaged by this over the last 18 years that I've been the pastor here. Where people who have been successful in the community, people who have been successful in their jobs, these are people that come into the church and assume that they need to be leaders of the church or to have their ideas adopted above other people. And they become divisive. They lobby for their ideas. They, they create small groups that will discuss these and discuss why others are wrong. And they divide the church because their maturity is in the world and worldliness and not spiritual maturity. It doesn't matter whether they've been in the church for one year or 50 years. They haven't grown spiritually. A spiritually mature person would be somebody eagerly wanting to unite the church to humbly and gently walk out their calling in a way that is worthy. Spiritual maturity is much different. Last week I used this scripture and I want to use this scripture again to point out what is spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity in Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 through 26. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. If you have not love, you're nothing but a loud gong. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Get this, it's gentleness. Spiritual maturity is gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions. This worldly maturity produces passions for leadership, passions for, for winning, passions for supporting their subgroup or their team that they create within the church or within the world. And they divide ab along these lines. It, the, it, the, there, it crucifies it. You nail on the cross, kill it, and bury it. And they, your passions are not like Jesus Christ. They won't rise again. Amen? And it's passions and it's desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. Let us not become conceited, especially those who have received gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can always backslide. You must be somebody who does not get prideful and conceited in your gifts because that is what comes before your fall. But we are not, we don't become conceited, provoking one another, provoking one another, having to get that last word, having to destroy someone's uh, uh, mood, because you yourself do not have the joy of the Lord. Envying one another because of their position or their gifts of the Holy Spirit. Or envying somebody for anything. Whether it's goods or provision or the home they live in, the car they drive. None of that should be part of your life if you are spiritually mature. But spiritually, spiritual maturity is a journey, as I said before. You can look at your maturity as a journey. That's a very strong pillar of theology that you must understand while you're growing in Christ. When you grow in Christ, you are on a journey. 
There are milestones in your journey. When we look at, uh, as Pentecostals, we look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we're, we're told by people that we think it's a second blessing. And that, no, we don't believe that whatsoever. There's no such thing as a second blessing. Listen, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is part of your journey. When you gave your life to Christ, it was already setting on the path ahead of you. It was already there, setting and waiting for you to make your journey in your initial time of your initial salvation to walk toward the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was given the day you gave your life to Christ and set upon the path that Christ had for you. But maybe you didn't want to walk on the journey of spiritual maturity. And once you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receive a gift, and maybe you just stop there. You don't go on anymore. Uh, you don't walk any longer. You don't become more mature. Maybe you reach a place where you're uh, a teacher or a preacher or you're somebody who is uh, part of administrations or, or uh, evangelizing and you stop there. You think you've arrived. Well, you haven't. If you're not dead, you haven't arrived. You are still on a journey and there are more mileposts. There are, there's more growth. There's more Christ-likeness waiting for you. And that excites me. You see, a spiritual maturity is not a chore for me to get done. Spiritual maturity is the rest of my life, and I praise God for it. I'm not going to be the same Brian Shepherd that I was 15, 20, 30 years ago when I got saved. I'm not going to be the same pastor that I was 18 years ago when I arrived here. I'm not going to be the same pastor that I am now 10 years from now or 20 years from now. But I want to mature in Christ. Never give up that part of your journey. During your journey towards spiritual maturity, you will, you will begin to encounter spiritual gifts. And you will mature in your ability to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's not just one time and for all. That is a continuous growth. You will become more and more and more able to be able to minister in the power of the Spirit. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. In saying he ascended, speaking of Jesus, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of or the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might that he might fill all things. In your version, it might be saying, fulfill all things. This scripture speaks about the journey that Jesus Christ took. Now listen, Jesus Christ was on a journey. He came down from heaven to the earth that we live on today. And he walked among men and women. And then he took... He, continued his journey downward. When he died and was laid in the grave, he descended into Hades. He had the keys. He took the keys to death and hell. He took the keys and he came back up. And listen, he took many out of the grave with him. And so he came up having set many captives free and continues to set many captives free who are giving their lives to Christ each and every day over the, over the last 2,000 years and more. Setting captives free. This journey of going down and then down again. This scripture speaks about that entire journey. The entire journey from heaven to this earth we walk on to death and where he was for three days. And then the journey continues. The journey back home. He journeyed from death to life again and was seen by many witnesses, including 500 on a single day when he finished his journey and ascended into heaven. He, was, he is living now in a place above all the heavens. Jesus Christ took a journey and therefore he is able to give gifts to humankind. This journey down and then up again fulfilled all things. The work he did in person has finished and now he is leaving it to the church 
to continue his ministry and to take, uh, and to take us through the journey of our life. See, he gives gifts so that we can continue, continue his work. His work didn't finish when he ascended into heaven. He is now the head of the church. Let me tell you something. If you don't love church, if you don't love the church, then I don't know whether you love Christ because you can't have the church unless you have Christ. You've got to have Jesus Christ as the head of the church now, I know church is messy. Church is difficult. I talked to you about the problem of the Holy Spirit in church when there's many fakes and there's wolves in sheep's clothing. That was prophesied before Christ even came that that would be part of the children of God. But you know what? Never once has any of that destroyed the church, destroyed its mission. It has not, not, never destroyed those who are faithful to Christ. They have always overcome in the power of the Spirit. And so today, I tell you, love Christ and join the church. You can't be a lone ranger. You must join the church. Pick a church. It can be our church. It can be another church. Bless that church. But allow yourself to be on the journey of spiritual maturity or else you will be somebody who disrupts the church. You need to submit to the leadership of that church you join. Because if you don't, then you're nothing more than a wolf in sheep's clothing that will devour others. You must submit to them so that you can continue the journey. You are on a journey and you will finish it. He has a work and a purpose for you and your journey, you will fulfill it as a person full of the Holy Spirit and empowered by the a gift or two gifts of the Holy Spirit. You don't have all the gifts because the church has all the gifts in the people. That's why you need to be part of the church. Just being somebody who heals is not good enough. But if you're part of a church that has all of the gifts, then that will be enough to overcome. Amen. So be a part of the church to continue his ministry. Let's move on to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And it says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, or in your version it may say pastors and teachers. Now this is not some sort of order of hierarchy. And in my opinion... These are gifts that reside within the body of Christ, not within a person as a title. I don't think that pastor is a title. Now you call me that maybe because I pastor. I believe we can call somebody a prophet only if they prophesy and the prophecies are biblical and they come to pass. Then you might call that someone a prophet. Uh, if you're an evangelist, it's not because you preach in a church. No, you're, you're an evangelist because you go to people and lead them individually to Jesus Christ. You're not a teacher unless you teach something from God. Amen? It's got to be His Word. And you can't be a teacher just with the knowledge of the Word or knowledge of the world. You have to be a teacher who has been transformed and born again and walks in the Spirit step by step with the Spirit or otherwise you're not really a teacher that has been given by God. An apostle. What a misunderstood word. It's the sent one. And I believe that apostles can be sent for two reasons. One is to establish like a missionary to establish or someone who reestablishes like leadership within the church to establish or reestablish the lordship of Jesus Christ. And into, into uh, the ability to do that, they must be somebody who has uh, the gift to evangelize, the gift to, to pastor and the gift of teaching. But an apostle is someone sent to establish the lordship of Jesus Christ. And prophets, oh my goodness, Listen, uh, teachers are given a warning that they can't be false teachers, but prophets, it says, woe to the prophet. Do not prophesy false prophecies. Amen. Let's go on to Ephesians chapter 4. Why were these five abilities of the church given to them? Why is the body of Christ equipped with these abilities to be an apostle, to establish the lordship of Christ, to prophesy, to uh, evangelize people to the, to the faith, and to pastor others, and to teach others? Why was the entire body given this ability? For this reason, 
in Ephesians 4.12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now listen, these five gifts, these five gifts have been given to prepare the church for ministry and for building up the body of Christ. So, these five positions are building up the body of Christ. Encouraging them, teaching them, preparing them, equipping them, but not just for their personal satisfaction. Too many Christians get stuck in that mode. They may have started off on fire and operating in the gift of evangelism or operating in, a, in other gifts of the Holy Spirit, but then they become satisfied. And church becomes something where they want to receive. Feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. Like a crying baby in the next room. Feed me, feed me. I need my bottle. My diaper needs to be changed. But that's not what equipping means. That's not what building up means. It's just constantly feeding insatiable desires to learn more and more and more like the Gnostics did 2,000 years ago to, so that they can become elite, elite in their knowledge. No, that's not what these five positions are for. These five positions are for you going out into this world and ministering. The word minister means servant. Ministry means serving. And so the church is raised up. I, I believe that we're doing fairly good because when I see you, when these names of these people that were popping up online and I saw their names, I, saw, I thought to myself, when, in light of this message I was about to, br to bring, I looked at them and I go, there's a servant. There's a servant. There's someone serving in the community. There's someone serving in the church. There's somebody serving in their family. There's another servant. There's another servant. And so you are prepared to a certain place. But listen, this building is never finished. This building that we're building up is never finished. This body of Christ is never finished. There's always going to be a new person. There's always going to be a new part of the building coming into place. This building is never finished, so don't stop your journey just because you can point to yourself and say, I have served. No, what new service, what more powerful service can I be a part of? What can grow in me, in my personal calling as I attach myself to the church and the calling that that church has? My goodness. I think I'm falling in love with the Apostle Paul all over again. This chapter of chapter 4, read it over and over again. Put yourself in the place. Ask yourself, where am I in my journey? Have I stopped my walk? Listen, listen, this is how you get through a long hike. You tell yourself, when you're tired, rest, but don't quit. When you're tired, rest, but don't quit. When you're on this lifetime journey, you will get tired. You'll walk through dry places. You'll be thirsty. You'll need to have others minister to you rather than you constantly ministering. There are those times, so rest, rest, be renewed. Even Jesus walked away to a solitary place and was refreshed as he rested. But don't ever quit. Rest with a plan to get back up and continue your journey. And you will reach the end. You will reach the goal, that finish line. And you'll hear those words from Christ that all of us want to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. The one who hears those words is not the one who runs fast at the beginning of the journey and then sets down and does nothing for the rest of their life. The one who hears those words is the one that keeps running. Resting enough to keep the journey going. So I challenge you today. Look at the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. And be somebody who absolutely meets the challenge of serving others. Hello. God. Welcome to church. It's very lonely without you guys, but we're grateful that we have this opportunity and this uh, way of connecting with you. I saw someone in the comments saying, you know, thank God for being able to stay connected. So we are grateful uh, that we do have this opportunity. But yeah. uh, Anyway, I just want to give a shout out to Adrian. Adrian's thank you for hearting and loving us so much. Those are virtual amens and preaches. And, and Robert, awesome. hi, I'm glad you're there with 
with your grandmother watching us too. And Tyler, Julie, I don't know, Ellie and Gabriel, are y'all watching too? If so, hi. I miss you guys so much. Oh my goodness. We miss Sorry. all of you guys so much. We've been thinking about you a lot. Um, and we just pray that you were blessed by the service, blessed by the word of God. Um, I was just so encouraged by uh, Paul's writings to the church to remind us that we all have a, a function to serve. And if you continue to read in the Old in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about, Paul talks about uh, being one body with many members. And I know that we're many of us are familiar with the scripture um, where you know Paul describes each person is a, it has a certain function in the body. And this is exactly what Pastor Brian was talking about today. Um, you know, an eye acts as an eye for the body. It sees, uh, a mouth speaks, uh, a heart beats, and, and provides circulation of the blood. Um, it's, just, it's the same in, in the church body. If we're not walking in, if we're not uh, serving in the function in which we were purposed by God, then the body begins to function. Sure, yeah, the heart, the heart, or, well, the heart probably can't stop beating because then you won't have life, but you know, you can use a, you can lose a, a, a thumb or a toe or a foot or a leg, and you can still survive that. The body can definitely survive that, but it's not as efficient. It's not a, it's not functioning the way God wants it to function. And this is what Pastor was alluding to, and what Paul's writings were alluding to, in that if we don't serve in the function and the purpose that God has created us to serve in the church body, that one body, yeah, we can continue on. But are we functioning in a way that uh, is efficient, not necessarily efficient, but in the way it's purposed, the way God has designed it? Uh, I think the answer is no. Um, We can, you know, if you lose a foot or a leg, you can limp along with a cane. If we lose a person who is not, uh, who's not serving in the capacity in which God has designed them to serve, then, um, then, then the church can continue, but we're definitely hurting a little bit. We're definitely not walking the way uh, or moving in the way that, that God has designed us. So we anyways. just wanted to say thank you again for joining us. We miss you guys, and we hope you have a safe and blessed week. Yeah. So, Father, we just, we just thank you for this opportunity to connect with our church family, and we pray your blessing be upon them, that you would, your hand would be upon them, protect us and sustain us uh, and just allow us to stay connected in different and unique and creative ways this week. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you guys Amen. so much. Thanks love for joining guys. us. Thanks for hanging out with us. We hope to see you soon. Taylor. Oh. Like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're on Facebook, give hit the little thumbs up button, please. <laughs> All right, guys. We love you. Thanks for hanging out with my goofy family and goofy pastor. Right, Pastor? (laughs) We love you guys. High fives to everybody.